One more, more time. Lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift his name up one more time. Hallelujah. Give him a great shout of praise in the house. Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy in this place. Mighty God. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. I think we can close up shop right now, go to the house and say we've already had church this morning. But the Lord has a word. I promise to not hold you that long. Your not long and my not long may be different, so that don't mean nothing. No, I promise I'm not going to hold you that long this morning. Praise God. If you have your swords with you, your swords is your Bible around here. We call them the swords because that's what we use to chop the head of the enemy off with. Amen. That's what we use to attack the devil with. When he comes against you and against your family, you got the mightiest weapon in your arsenal, the Word of God. You pick up that sword and you go to chopping the head of the enemy off. Don't give him any power over you or your family. But first Samuel, it's right before second Samuel, if that helps you any. First Samuel, I know I'm a smart aleck sometimes. <laughs> I'm teasing. First Samuel chapter number 30, where we're going this morning. When you find the place, if you stand for the reading of God's word, 1 Samuel chapter number 30. 1 Samuel chapter number 30. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter number 30. I'm going to start reading verse number 1. You found the place? Yeah. Amen. All right, let's read. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them away and they went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no power to weep anymore. Anybody ever been there before? Cry till you ain't been able to cry anymore. And David's two wives, Ahinoam and the Jezreelites, Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Then David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But, I like this, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, they came to the brook of sword, where those stayed who were left behind. But David pursued him 400 men, for 200 stayed behind who were so weary that they could not even cross the brook with sword. Then they found an Egyptian in the field, and they brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, uh, a servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites in the territory which belongs to Judah. And of the southern area of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. So when he had brought him down there, they were spread out over all the lands, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. 
And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was lacking. You hear this? Nothing of theirs was lacking. Either small or great, sons or daughters, full or anything that was taken from them. David recovered all. Last verse. Then David took all the flocks and the herds which they had driven before those other livestock and said, This is David's spoil. This morning I want to talk to you about going in the enemy's town, taking back everything that he stole from you. Amen. And not just about that, but about roadblocks on the road to your destiny. Roadblocks on the road to your destiny. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you, God, for what you have already accomplished here this morning. And we just pray right now, Lord, that you would have your way in this service. Anoint these lips of clay to proclaim your gospel. Lord, and anoint the ears of the ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to your church. And we promise to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Would you give him one more praise as you guys sing? Well, I don't know about you this morning, but I feel like we've already had church. I feel also like I've dived head first off into a 12-foot swimming pool and have went to the bottom. I'm soaking wet. So y'all just bear with me a little bit. Praise the Lord. It, he has, I've been in the fire this morning. That's for sure, Sister Sonny said. But have you ever watched the movie? And the movie starts out kind of toward it's the beginning of the movie, but it seems like it starts toward the end of the movie. And all of a sudden, they just say, hold up, let's rewind. If you want to figure out how we got here, let's rewind just a little bit, and I will tell you how we got to where we are today. So this morning, that's what I want to do for just a few moments of your time. I want to rewind just for a second and show you how David got to where he is today. Right here where David is getting attacked. Uh, while his wives got took and their kids got took. And everybody's backs that was for David is now against him and they're wanting to kill him. And, and all hell is breaking loose in David's life. I want to take you back just for a moment in time to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. I want to share with you a word uh, that the Lord has put in my heart right here. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God doing something to a young boy named David. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, David was a young teenage boy, and he was a young shepherd boy who was minding his own business. He was just out working for his daddy, watching his sheep. Y'all know the story. He was just out there minding his own business. David wasn't praying to be uh, made a, a king. He wasn't praying. He had never run for office. He had never did anything like that. The only thing David had ever knew was he was a shepherd for his daddy. But God had other plans for his life. I'm going to ask you a question in here before we get started. And I just want to see who I'm talking to this morning. And I want to see uh, what your beliefs are, if that's all right. I want to know, do you believe in God this morning? By the show of hands, I believe every hand in here ought to go up. Now, I want to know, do you believe that whether you've ever held any kind of office or not in this room, do you believe if God wanted to make you president of the United States tomorrow that God could do that? Yeah. Amen. All right, I'm talking to some people that's got faith then. Because David had never run for office a day in his life. David was a young teenage boy minding his own business, but God had plans for him and great plans indeed. He had plans that David didn't even have any idea about. I got some news for you in this room this morning is God has plans for you guys that you ain't even, even heard of before. I'm talking about, do you know how crazy it must have been for David? All of a sudden, in 1 Samuel 16, the Bible said there was a prophet by the name of Samuel that come to his house, come to David's house with a big old jug of anointing oil. And it was not a jug of anointing oil like this. This was a little bitty tension when he this was like a salt shaker. When I say they took and anointed him, I'm talking, have y'all ever seen the, the 1540 gallon-sized motor oil jugs. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. 
the big jugs. That's what they went around with with anointing oil. When Samuel went to David's house, he didn't go just to sprinkle David. He went to cover David. He went to make sure that he got soaked with the oil from heaven. That God sent him there for a reason to anoint him with oil. That he was going to be a king of Israel. Now, David is still out in the back watching his daddy's sheep and, and still don't have a clue what's about to hit him. I want to go ahead and say something to you. God, just like he done David, he is about to launch some of you. Get this word, launch. L-A-U-N-C-H. This is what I heard the Lord speak to me this week. Launch, just like a rocket is launching to the moon. God is getting ready to launch some of you into your destiny. He's getting ready to launch you into the place that he has for you uh, to do his will and to accomplish what his dreams and his purpose and his plans is for your life. Now, if you don't believe it, you might as well close your Bible and exit stage left right now. But if you believe it, you hang in here to the end of this message and you go ahead and just trust God and believe God and watch what God does in your life. Because the Bible said those that are near to the end, the saints shall be saved. If you give up now, you'll never see the promised land. If you give up now, you'll never make it through. you got to hang in there like a hair in a biscuit. you got to hang in there with God. You hold on to God with everything you have. This world's going to try to knock your hand out of his hand. But you go ahead and let the enemy know I'm not turning loose to my Savior's hand. No hell can rise against me. I'm holding on. The anchor holds the sickness comes to my house. I'm still, I might be feeble, but I'm holding on anyways. Hallelujah, the trouble comes. I'm going to believe and trust God anyways. The drama comes. I will oversell that. Hallelujah, I'm dead. The devil is going to throw everything he can in roadblocks to try to stop you from reaching your destiny. And when I say your destiny, I, I'm not just talking about a fairy tale ending. I'm talking about a beginning. Woo! People, when you say destiny, they want to think, well, you know, I'm going to live happily ever after. No. I'm talking about your destiny is the place where God's perfect will is for your life. It is a place where God has already seen you. It is a place where God, see, God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. I hope everybody follows on with me. God can see you before you were saved, and God can see you way after. He knows what you are able to become. We just can't see it. Because our flesh is weak. Our spirit's ready, but our flesh is weak. But God has a plan for you. David was a little bitty shepherd boy, but God said you're a king. There's a big difference between sitting out there watching stinking sheep uh, and ruling a country of Israel that God said is my people. But God said, I have greatness in you, David, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a man after my own heart. Uh, and I've got to go ahead and prophesy over some people in this room this morning. Uh, for the Lord has sent me this way to tell you uh, that you get ready because God's getting ready to use you and send you into the places, uh, hallelujah, where you least expect. It, uh, but get ready because the enemy is going to start sending roadblocks your way. Uh, when you begin to start working for God uh, and start working toward that goal that God has for your life, listen, you never know what roadblocks are until you get into ministry. Listen, I thought I knew what roadblocks were. I thought I knew. But when you start working for God, when you start doing something for God, you better watch out because it's going to come from the left, the right, up, down, ever which way that it can come. Hell is coming against you. Why? Because hell is through feeling threatened by what you are doing. And hell is not going to come against you if it has you where it wants you. But if you're not affecting hell and its borders, then hell's going to leave you alone. But if you're making trouble for hell, then hell's 
going to try to come and make trouble for you. But I got some good news for you in here this morning. Hallelujah. Those that know their God. The book of Daniel says you shall be strong and do exploits. You keep standing for God. You keep standing on the word of God and don't you give up. Hallelujah. God is putting his anointing on the inside of you. And no hell may come against you. The gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every idle word that rises up against you in judgment shall what? Be condemned. Oh, mighty God. So the first word here we find out is launch. David was a shepherd boy, but he was launched into his destiny. All of a sudden, we find out God sent Samuel to his house. Woo! And Samuel shows up. And he brings in that gallon of oil. And he said, God sent me here, Jesse, to find out you got some boys in your house. Jesse said, yeah, I got a lot of sons. He said, well, I need to meet them. Y'all know the story? First Samuel chapter number 16. Jesse, that's David's daddy. And Jesse said, well, here's my boy. He's a masculine man. He's big and strong, got muscles. Oh, yeah, he looks good. Uh, he was a pro football player. Now, I'm making that part up. But, uh, he was this. He, I'm putting it in our words today. He was this and that. And this is the one you want. And Samuel said, that ain't the one. That ain't him. And then he said, well, what about this other boy of mine? He's a hard worker. Man, he's got skills that you wouldn't believe. He can turn a wrench. He can run a plow. He can do anything you want him to do. And then Samuel looked at him again. And the Lord quickened his heart. He said, that's not the one either. And over and over and over again, he said, Jesse, is this the only son you got left? Jesse said, there's one more. There's one more. And he got all through all of his boys, except for one, David. They four or five sons that Jesse showed Samuel. And Samuel said, they ain't none of them. But all of a sudden, he said, I want to see your other boy. And the Bible said he was a really red-headed. He was not much to look at, but he was out there in the back forty watching his daddy's sheep. He didn't have on no right guard. He didn't have on no left guard. And when you come in, he was stinking. But immediately, when Samuel the prophet seen David rise up over the hill, God quickened him. And he said, that's the boy I want right there. That's going to be the king of Israel. And Samuel even questioned for a moment, God, are you sure? You see, God is able to take the ones that don't look the part. He's able to take the ones that's never been in politics and never been in any kind of thing like that. God's able to raise them up and get the glory for it. I'm here to tell you this morning there's some things that's going to happen in your life that you never thought was going to happen and God is going to get the glory for it. Yeah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God's going to launch you into your destiny. That's what he done, David. But immediately, when David was launched into his destiny, Samuel, let me read it to you, 1 Samuel 16, verses 10 through 13. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons. It wasn't five. It was seven. Seven of his sons passed before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So Samuel said to Jesse, are all of these young men here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping a sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down till he comes here. In other words, Samuel said, I come on a mission. And I'm not going to stop until I get what the Lord sent me here for. Somebody needs to get a backbone like right that for the Lord. I'm on a mission for God and I'm not going to stop until I get what the Lord sent me here for. My God, when you go to the prayer closet, go ahead and get a backbone like Jacob. Lord, I'm not turning loose until you bless me. Lord, I'm not going to stop until I get what I come here for. Mighty God. And so that's what Samuel said. He said, I'm not even going to sit down until they come. And so verse number 12 said, So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Amen. 
Arise and anoint him. This is the one that I want. This is the boy right here. This is the, my God, nobody else wants him. But God wants him. That may be some of you in this room that have felt that way. You might have felt like an outcast. Everybody turned their back on that. And nobody else might want to have anything to do with you. But let me tell you something. God loves you. And God said, you're the one I want. You're the one I care for. You're the one I'm going to raise up. And I am going to bring glory and honor from heaven on your life and in your life and through your life. So he sent and brought him in. And he said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Last verse, verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil. I love this. And he anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Woo! And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and he went to Ramah. Mighty God, right here, David was launched from the beginning of his childhood. He was just a shepherd boy. But the moment that Samuel came in the door, his life changed from that moment forward. He said, the Lord sent me here for a purpose, to anoint one of your boys as king over Israel. And then he got to David. He took the oil. All of his brothers had always made fun of David. All of his brothers had always looked down upon him. David was just a, a young weakling. All of them were big, strong, and good looking, and David was just a shepherd boy. He was the pushover. But the Bible said that Samuel, in the presence of his brothers, he anointed his head with oil. And I love what the Bible said in the book of Psalms. It said that God is going to anoint your head with all in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. Surely goodness and mercy that's going to follow you all the days of your life. All the people that has been on nipping on your heels trying to take you down and take you out. God is going to anoint you in front of them. God's going to bless you in front of them. Woo! Now, what happens the devil notices that God starts blessing you. The enemy notices that God is launching you and he's picking you up. He's turning you around. He's giving you a new name. He's giving you a new identity because now David don't identify as a shepherd. Now David identifies as a king. You think... If a brother comes to me and says, you're the next king of Israel, you think I'm going to stay out there watching sheep all the time? I'm going to say, Daddy, yeah, I'll watch the sheep, but I'm the king. Now listen, we can let some things, we have to change. Some of my brothers going to have to watch these sheep, some too. We're going to let some more. Praise the Lord. you got to obey your father and my mother, though. Praise God. But listen, David knew in his heart that he was not just a shepherd anymore. That he was the king. And so he was looking forward to fulfilling the plans that God had for his life. But immediately, as soon as the blessing of God came, as Samuel anointed him, immediately the enemy started sending roadblocks. Immediately. They would start to be war after war after war. And young David would find himself in the middle of all these battles. In the middle. And so David, in next chapter, he fights a man by the name of Goliath. Y'all have heard of him. Goliath of Gath. Nine foot tall, six inches. That's a big old dude. And Goliath of Gath. He was out there and the whole armies of Israel was hiding, their armor clinging and everything else. They're hiding in a foxhole. Young David is bringing his brothers, the ones that he was anointed in their presence. Remember that. The ones that was making fun of him. Now they're in the military and David's back at home and he's still watching the sheep but he makes sandwiches for his brother. So he says, I'm going to take them some sandwiches. I'm going to take them some PB and J. Some crustables, whatever, whatever you want, whatever you like, grilled cheeses. And so he carries them down to the battlefield. And while David is on his way to the battlefield, he 
hears this old Goliath out there shouting. He hears them cursing God and cursing the God of Israel. And he begins to say, I've come to fight any one of you. I'll fight you and I'll fight your God. You serve a dead God. We Philistines serve the living God. And any one of y'all that wants to fight, I'll fight you from sun up to sun down. Send me out. I'm a champion. And everybody in Israel, their armor, they're in the foxhole. David comes down and says, where's everybody at? Is there not a cause? Can you not hear this uncircumcised Philistine cussing the God of Israel? Is there not a cause for men to stand up and be go to war and be a man? Quit being a sissy. Quit being a jellyback. Quit being a spineless coward. Get up out of the foxhole and go to war. That's where our men are today. A lot of them are sissy, fine, jelly, back, smileless cowards uh, who had rather sit on the, the sofa and play Nintendo instead of getting up, going to work, and being a man. Uh, they want to sit behind a computer screen and play video games all day uh, and holler and scream at the women. Uh, let me tell you something. You better man up uh, and be who you're called to be. Uh, be a leader. Be a priest. Be a king of your home. Uh, lead your family to God. Be a leader as long as you're doing that. The man is supposed to be men. Uh, I gotta get off. But David, his little teenager, comes down there. And he's more of a man than the whole army of Israel. And he said, send me out there, I'll go. Little bitty teenage boy said, I'll go out there if all this army is not wanting to go. And they said, You can't go out there, you're just a kid. What David said, David said, God was with me when a bear come. He said, in the spirit of God, come on me. And I took that bear out with my bare hands. And he said, then another time a lion come. I was watching my daddy's sheep. And let the spirit of God come upon me. And I took that lion out with my bare hands. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That my God ain't able to deliver him into my hands today too. And that guy, the Saul, the king, he looked at him and he said, let me give you my armor. I ain't got time to preach all of this. But David said, your armor ain't tried, but my God is. Yeah. Your armor ain't proven, but my God is proven. Over time and time and time again, God has showed up for me, and that's more than enough. I don't need your armor. I don't need your suit of mail. That's what they call it, a suit of mail. I don't need your suit of mail. I don't need your spear. He said, I'm going to go out here and pick up five smooth stones, because Goliath's got four brothers. And I'm believing that the name of the Lord God that I'm going out in, God is going to deliver that giant into my hands this day. Goliath goes out. He picks up them stones. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He goes out. That giant says, who'd you send out here? Dog? I told you to send me out a champion. You send me a dog. And Goliath, or David, looked at him. He said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a, a, a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And today, Goliath, your head's going to be chopped off by your own sword. And the Bible said, immediately David took that stone, put it in his sling. He began to do like this right here. And the Holy Ghost done the rest. The Spirit of Almighty God began to... And wow, he let that thing go. And it went direct and right toward him. And the Holy Ghost hit him right in the crack of the armor. Down went Goliath. David goes over. Little teenager probably barely couldn't even get Goliath's sword out of his. Probably so heavy. He got that sword, the Bible said. He got Goliath's own sword. Picks it up. Chops the head of Goliath off. Goliath was the seed of the serpent. As the seed of the devil. He chopped the head of the devil off that day. And took it. I wish I had time to preach to tell you about where he carried the head. And about where he buried it out. And about how the cross of cap by God at the place of the skull. But I ain't got time to go into all that today. But that's a good message. Woo! About how they pierced Jesus' heel and how Jesus crushed his head. My God, I wish I had time to tell you about it. But I got to get back to this right now. 
And the Bible said he took the horn of oil and he immediately, he, he went ahead and anointed him. And the battle started coming. After Goliath, when David took him down, there was many more battles. Lots more battles. Well, David was listening to the Lord. And God delivered David through all of them. And what happened? Let me tell you what happened. The people of Israel began to lift David up. And they began to say, David slew his ten thousands. While Saul only slew thousands. And Saul's the king. And Saul, now he begins to get jealous. He begins to get tail hurt. Can I say that? He begins to get backside hurt. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so anyways, he begins to get all mad and jealous and tell her. And he said, you know what? I'm going to kill that boy. Ain't that just like the enemy? When God has great plans for you, the enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. But God said, but I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. I come today with a message to tell you, you cannot kill what God's anointed to live. You cannot stop what God has anointed to go forth. You cannot, the enemy can't do it as long as God has got his hand upon you. The enemy can never stop. Oh, mighty God, you can't do it. You cannot do it. And so we find out that Saul gets jealous. This is the part that a lot of us don't know about it. Because a lot of us, we've read about Clyde, but we never stopped to read. And we've read about Ziklag, about how he goes in and takes his stuff back. But we don't read the little few chapters in between. Because this is what we fail to realize. First Samuel chapter 22. Let me turn over there. First Samuel 22. As David is finding out that Saul's trying to kill him. David begins to tuck tail and run. And he's running from Saul and he runs to a wicked king of the Philistines. The Philistines is who Goliath was. He's of that wicked serpent. He's of that tribe. And they hate Israel. And David begins to make a covenant with the king of the Philistines. Let me tell you something. David had just, God made him a destiny, but now he's got his back against the wall and he goes and he's, he's trying to get half in and half out. He's trying to, he's trying to play both. Oh my God, I can't get it out of my mouth because it's so bad. He's trying to play the best of both worlds. He wants to be half in and half out. He wants to be blessed of God, but he also wants to have the blessing that's, that's going on over here in Philistine too. But it's time that the children of God become like Moses in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it is, or no, excuse me, it's on down to Hebrews 13, maybe. It says, by faith, it's the faith chapter. By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, he chose rather to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have been called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. But instead he said, that's not who I am. Amen. I'm a Hebrew. I'm one of God's children. And so he didn't play the best of both worlds. But he made up his mind, I'm all in for God. I'm not going to play the part when the Hebrews are around. And when the Pharaoh's around, I'm not going to play that part. A lot of people want to be wishy-washy. When the church people's around, we want to be churchy. But when the world's around, we want to be worldly. But it's time to make up your mind because you may be fooling the church. You may be fooling the preacher. You may be fooling some people. But you ain't fooling God. But it's not going to be any excuses when you get before God one day in heaven. He's going to say, I knew you not. A bipolar Christian is a no Christian. What You shouldn't talk like that, Brother Chad. I'm telling you the truth. You're either all in or you're all out. You can't be for God today and against Him tomorrow. If you are, you're against Him all the time. David, get this. This is, this is what's crazy. So David, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2. I'm just going to read two verses. David therefore departed 
from there and he escaped to the cave of Adilon. And when his brothers and all of his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Get this. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him today. So he became captain over them, and there was about 400 men. So now David, he's talked to this king, Achish, who was the Philistine king, and he's hiding out in a cave. And now he's hiding out in this cave, and he's made a covenant with the king of Philistine. Now 400 men, who is all messed up people, they, they're men who are running also, men who are in debt, who the creditors are looking for. Men who are running, who are discomforted, who are mad, who are messed up in the mind. Now all of these people have connected themselves with David in this cave. Woo. This is crazy. This is cra and if you'll read your Bible right before 1 Samuel 22, David himself, when he went before King Achish, the Bible said that David even pretended to be crazy. It said that he began to slobber out his mouth and he began to, to draw on the wall with crayons. It didn't say crayons, but it said he began to draw on the wall, slobber out his mouth, and begin to just act crazy. And the king said, this man's insane. He ain't coming to my house. Come on, bro. Come on. How far will play in church, how far will you go? David's supposed to be a man of God's own heart. But here he is playing a part. Woo! I don't, I don't want to talk to me today. Y'all get quiet. But you know it's real. There's too many people playing parts in the church of God today. There's too many people that wants to play while like we're having a, a, a play in here. And, and this is not a play. This is real life. Either get in or get out. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Uh, be a Christian or don't be a Christian. Uh, but make up your mind. God knows either way. Either you're for him or you're against him. But don't be lukewarm. Just make your mind up. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we find out in 1 Samuel 30 where we are today. 1 Samuel 30. Hallelujah. That was the losers. God launched his destiny. Then the losers were connected to David. All the losers. But David made them warriors. We find out that he turned those men into warriors. People who <laughs> learn how to fight. Yeah. And we find out today we're in 1 Samuel 30. It said it happened. When David and his men, when they come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and they attacked Ziklag and they burned it with fire. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great and they did not kill anyone but they carried them away and they went their way. So David and his men came to the city and there it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive and David and the people who were with him Remember, that's the 400 men who had joined themselves with him. It said they, they, the men that were with him, all their wives, their sons, and their daughters have been taken. David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. That's pretty bad. So here they are. They've been hiding and they've been, they've been fighting and all these things. There's battle after battle after battle. Roadblock. David's supposed to be king of Israel. He's been anointed way a long time ago. And now he's finding himself in all these different places. I come today to tell you the enemy loves to put stumbling blocks and roadblocks in front of you to try to stop you from getting to where God has for you. Some of you may get there tomorrow. Some of you may not get there for another 10 years. But I come to tell you, don't you give up on what God has for you because help is on the way. And it is coming. And don't you dare give in and give up because God has already said you are going to do this and it's coming for you and it's yours. It is your destiny. It is God's plan for your life. Don't you dare think that God has forgotten about you. But some of us have to go through these stops along the way because God is teaching us things. And we find out that David stopped off so many different times right here. And now here's just another time. It said that David's two wives. Man, I can't keep up with one with a long two. 
My goodness, thank God we can't have but one wife. I couldn't understand these. Man, the people watch that show, what is that, sister wives? The Lord Jesus. Woo! Yeah, no thank you. Yeah, yeah, no thank you. And so we find out anyways, we find out David and his men, they come back. Their wives are gone. Their sons, their daughters have been took. That's enough to make you mad. That's enough to hurt your heart. Your sons, your daughters have been taken. Your wives are gone. They've been taken captive and you don't know who got them. And so the Bible says they begin to weep, they begin to cry, and they can't even cry no more. They cried so much that tears won't even come out no more. They're heartbroken. I don't know if anybody's ever been there before, but you've cried so much that tears won't even begin to come out no more. But the Bible says that's where they were. David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, I'm going to go on down, had been taken captive. Then David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. All those guys that were for David and who had, who had won all these victories because of David have now turned their back upon him because they felt like David had allowed this to happen. David was kind of the leader of the bunch. And they felt like David allowed their kids to get took. And David allowed their wives to get took. So they're going to turn around, even though David's the one that had them, got them the victory. Because David had that connection with the Lord. Now they're turning their back on him and going to stone him. So David, not only has he lost his wives and his kids, but now everybody's going to kill him. And David is distressed. All the people trying to stone him. And David could give up. And if David would have given up this day, he would have missed his destiny of being king. If David would have stopped this day and would have said, this Lord, take me out now, I'm done. Or if he would have been like Elijah or Moses, who both said, Lord, just kill me right now. Lord, just go ahead and end my life. Do you realize Moses asked God for suicide? So did Elijah. You notice Moses went up on the mountain and God took him. Elijah, God took him. Yeah. Yeah. You notice yeah. that? Yeah. If David would have said, Lord, just go ahead and kill me now, I, I'm just, I'm done. But he didn't. The Bible said instead, David went and strengthened himself in the Lord. I come to take to tell you, every one of us in this room, you better not quit where you are right now. You better not give up where you are right now. When troubles come, when trials come, when sickness comes, when hardship comes, you don't throw in the towel. You go to the Lord. Don't you go to Facebook. Don't you go to Twitter. Don't you go to Instagram. You go to God. And you listen to God's voice. It ain't going to find this good gospel news on MSNBC or NBC or CNN or not even on Fox News. You've got to go to the Kingdom Network. Hallelujah. You've got to get it straight from the book. You've got to get it straight from the prayer closet. You've got to go to the man himself, the God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. You've got to go to Jesus and encourage yourself. Here's the thing. Every one of us, we must believe because Jesus, the Lord, is wanting to encourage you every single day. But you've got to believe that he is wanting to do that when you go to him. You've got to trust and believe that Romans 8.28. What does Romans 8.28 say? For we know, we're not that we believe, we know all things. Not some things, not most things. We know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to His purpose. See, you must believe God's Word or don't believe it at all. If you don't believe God's Word, like I said a while ago, close the book, exit stage left, this ain't going to do you no good. This is just a psychiatrist meeting right now if you don't believe the book. 
But if you believe this book, if you believe and got faith in the God who wrote this book, this is not just another book. This is 66 books that was written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. Uh, my God, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. And one man comes down and got all the prophecies correct. That, that is undeniably outstanding. And they say, oh, my God, so accurate, each one of them. It is mind-blowing. This is the God of the universe that created heaven and earth. This is his Word to you. And you must believe there is no other way around it. No other book can do That's why this book is still today. And that's why it's banned in many different countries. And that's why you get in trouble and go to jail in many countries for having this book. Because there's power and authority in the words of God. No other book can give you what this book can give you. So David strengthened himself in the Lord God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And that ephod, if you'll remember Wednesday night in Bible study, those of you that were here, I told you about the Urim and the Thummim. That's what the ephod, he put the Urim and Thummim in the ephod and he would pull them out. He would ask the Lord. He would begin to pull them out and the Lord would speak to him and tell him, yes, pursue, go after him. He went to the uh, Ahimelech and he said, bring the ephod to me. And so he brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, you're going to recover all. Without fail, you are going to recover everything. Everything that the enemy has took from you. Everything that the enemy took from you, you're getting it back. Somebody, praise God. You're getting your joy back. You're getting your peace back. You're getting your health back. You're getting your relationships back. You're getting your money back. You're getting your money. God, hallelujah to the Lamb. You're getting what the enemy has took from you. Praise God. Encourage yourself in the Lord this morning uh, and go take, pursue, and take back what the enemy has took from you. Uh, pursue him and without fail. You cannot fail as long as you go. Not in the arm of flesh. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by my spirit, said the Lord. We go in the spirit of God. Now, I'm going to hurry up and read this and we're done. So David went, and they all come, and they found him the in the field, and they brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water, and they gave him a piece of cake, and all two clusters of raisins, and when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water for three days and three nights. David said to him, to whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt. Egypt was one of Israel's greatest enemies. Egypt was one, and here he is. And here David is talking to this man. And he said, I'm a servant of Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. Let me tell you something. That's just the way the enemy does you. That's the way the world will do you. The enemy in the world will use you for what they can get out of you. And in the moment you can't benefit them, they will leave you high and dry. But God said, I'll take you in. I'll put shoes on you feet and clothes on your back. I'll put a ring on your thing. I'll kill the fatty calf. I'll welcome you home. We'll throw a party. We'll praise God together. Hallelujah. Listen, here we go. He said, three days ago I fell sick. They just left me. The people who took their wives and children left one person behind. Don't tell me this ain't a God thing. Don't tell me God can't work things out because this one deal here, here's a guy. And he said, we made an invasion of the southern area. And he said, and we burnt Ziklag with fire. So David said to him, can you take me down to this troop? And he said, swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will take you down to this troop. So when he had brought him down there, they were spread out over the land eating, drinking and dancing because of the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines or from the land of Judah. And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. This bunch of people who come in and took their wives and took their sons and took their daughters were down here partying. They down here drinking Bud Light, Budweiser, Michelob, 
They down here drinking Jim Bean, smoking on the J. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They down here singing Margaritaville and Jimmy Buffettville and all this other stuff. And here they are living it up. They, they shaking their tail feathers and everything else. They got it going on. Man, we just took their kids, took their wives, took their small. We going to throw the party. They didn't know that God had set up. Well, the man they left behind was God was going to use that man to take them down. God is able. And now let me tell you something. Woo! God is always one step ahead. Usually he's a lot more than one step ahead, but he listens. Likes us to think he's at least one step ahead. And when the enemy thinks he's got you and says, Check, mate, know this. Jesus has got one more move. He's always got one more move. Always got one more move. And so they got here partying, thinking just like the devil was partying on day one and day two at the cross. But day three, Jesus said, Check, mate. Hallelujah. Back here on this day. They're dancing and partying. But on this day, the Bible says, David, who's a man after God's own heart, says, checkmate. I'm coming in in the arm of the Lord. And we're taking back our wives and our children. We're coming after everything the Lord's took, everything that the Lord's give us and you took from us. We're coming back and without fail, we're getting back what you have took. And so we find out right here that they do that and nobody escaped except 400 guys that took off on camels. Could you imagine that? 400 dudes jumping on camels. Let's get out of here. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so he says, so David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his two wives. Nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and the herds which they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. Not only did they get back what was theirs, but they got back the spoil that belonged to the Amalekites. Not only did they get back their stuff, but they got back more. They got it back with interest. So I want you to stand this morning, if you will, all over the house. And we're going to go ahead and declare and decree that this morning, we're not just getting back what the devil's took, but we're going to get it back with interest. I don't want just what you took, devil. I want it back plus some. You didn't get it for free. You didn't just come into my camp and take stuff from me. You didn't just come into my camp and take stuff from my family. But devil, you stole from me and mine, and I'm coming back for it, and with interest. You're going to pay back restitution. You're going to pay it back and then some. And the Lord is going to make sure that you do it Amen. without fail. Praise God. Father, in the name above every name, I pray the prayer of faith over my brothers and sisters this morning. Lord, I pray on this road to their destiny, to the plans that you have for their lives. God, Lord, we pray that you would begin to launch them into that destiny, into that future, into that place that you have for them, into their anointing, into their calling, into their ministry, into whatever you would have for us to do, God. We know there's many different ways, different avenues that you would have us to go. Lord, I pray for divine revelation, for wisdom that you would teach us, show us what you want us to do, who you want us to be. And God, I just pray that these roadblocks that are coming toward us, Lord, that they would not stop us. But Lord, like David, we would begin to encourage ourselves in you. And Lord, that we would learn how to rejoice in you when the world is falling apart and when our lives are falling apart. Lord, I pray, help us, God, to get the joy of the Lord and the joy of the Holy Ghost on the inside of us. Lord, never to lose our faith, never to lose our peace, never to lose our joy. But God, whatever the enemies took this morning, we're going after it, and we're going after it with interest. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name, without fail, let it all start coming back to us this morning. Our brothers and our sisters, let it come this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let it start coming back in. Let it start, our families are coming back. Lord God, they're coming back in. They're going to be saved. Lord, relationships are going to be mended. Lord God, I pray that the finances are going to come. Lord, that souls are going to be one. The health is going to be healed.
on it. Lord, all these other things. Lord God, these weights, these burdens, these troubles, these troubles, it's all going to be worked out for our good. Lord Jesus, because we love you and we're called according to your purpose. So God, we give you the glory this morning. Let anybody watch my video this morning, God, if they don't know you, let them call on your name. Lord, it's easy to say, I'm sorry I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. Lord, would you come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me. Make me new. Write my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Lord, help me to live for you. I believe you died for me and rose for me. And I want to live for you. From this day forward, I don't want to ever be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord.